Well, good morning. How is everybody? Good to see you. Hope you had a good week. If you'll be opening your Bibles, I want to kind of backtrack just a little bit. But Ephesians, Ephesians, Esther, it starts with E, doesn't it? (laughs) Esther, Esther chapter 4. We're supposed to start in verse 15. I want to backtrack for just a second. Um, I was asked last week, and so I went and looked this up, and I was very interested myself, just unfortunately hadn't taken the time to do it. I was asked last week the population of Persia. And you got to understand that, that Persia itself had about 44% of, of the population at the point of time of Esther, it's believed. And so vast majority of the population of the world believed at the time of Esther that Persia had four or 50 million people in it. And approximately 20% of the population, um, 10 million, were Jews. And so we're talking about a large population of people that if 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 in the land of Persia, Haman wanted to get rid of uh, the Jews, he's talking about 10 million people. It's a huge, massive undertaking. And so that gives us some perspective. And uh, I was asked that and glad to research that and, and really glad to know. I had not taken the time to look it up. So anything else or any questions, comments, any any news we need to know that we don't know or things of that nature? I don't know of anything. All right. Well, we'll get started then. Esther chapter 4. I want us to go back. Do remember that uh, kind of a review a process. Remember that that Esther has ascended to be queen and that while we don't like the way it all was done, we have to remember, as we said last week, the story of Esther is a story that's told. And it's not so much, if you will, trying to set down the laws of morality and sexual morality and things of that nature as it is to tell a story. And so consequently, there are things such as how <coughs> excuse me, Esther became queen that we sit back and we say, man, that, that just, you know, that's not a Christian thing to do. Well, we get that. But consequently, we do get in the story, we get the providence of God. We get a lot of other things, and we get things that are good from Esther. I, every time I sit down and read Esther, I think of back several years ago. Uh, I forgot now who I had chosen, but I had chosen a lady of the Bible talking about her on Mother's Day. And this lady who was visiting, who I'd never seen before and have never seen since, came out and she said, you chose, and I, and I chose all the good qualities about the woman to, to talk about. And, and she, she said, you chose a, a terrible example for Mother's Day because, and she kept walking. I didn't hear what she said, but she wouldn't let me listen to her nor explain why I chose what I chose. That's to say, that story is to say this. In, in biblical characters, one of the, I think, great things about the Bible and one of the fascinating things about the Bible is is that the Bible doesn't just spend time talking about all the good qualities of people. And I mean when you look at, at Esther, you you see a lady that's somewhat wise. You see a lady that plans. You see a lady that has self control. You you see a lady that's self disciplined. You you see those things and you might say, yes, but how she became queen, gotcha. I understand that. Not right. But this is the way that the story goes. And so uh, when we look at, at this story, we see that, that Esther, of course, finds out that uh, Mordecai tells her or gets word to her that, that Haman is planning, or, or really not so much Haman. Of course, Haman was the mastermind behind it. He was the one planning it. But the extinction of the Jews, wipe out the Jews, and so knowing that and having heard that, then as word gets to her, Mordecai, who is her kinfolks, if you will, Mordecai wants her to intervene. 
And she's not sure about that. And that's kind of where I want us to, to kind of look back at, if you will, when you, you look at verses 10, 11, 12, and, and 13 following of chapter 4, you see that, that she reminds Mordecai, Esther reminds Mordecai, that she can't just walk into the king and say, well, here I am, I need to talk to you. That only those that are invited in by the king or those that once they get there, if you will, he welcomes them by putting his scepter forth and leaning it forth towards them. And that was the only way that if if they had come in, like Mordecai was was saying to Esther ought to, if they had just if she had just come in and said, Well, here I am, I want to talk, King kill her. And she knew that. And so she from that point she she's very leery of what's going on. And so Mordecai, verse 13, that's where I want us to look because we just kind of quickly ran over this little part. In, in verse 13, Mordecai asked, or answered Esther, do you think your heart in your heart that you will escape the king's palace any more than all the other Jews? In other words, Esther, you, you're in danger if you don't go talk to the king and if you don't get this plan that Haman has put into to place, if you don't go in, you're a Jew too. You're going to get this just like others would. And so he says in verse 14, For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will, per- will perish. Now, now think about this. Just stop right there. There is a period right there, and that's a good place to stop. Mordecai goes on to say, Look, Esther, if it's not you, it's going to be somebody else. God will protect his people. God will watch over his people. If it's not you, it'll be somebody else. But you need to know this. You need to know this, that he says you and or your, your father's house, your, your family, if you will. And he says they're not protected. You have the opportunity to protect. You have the opportunity to lead. You have the opportunity to be the conduit through which God works at this point in time. You have that opportunity. And then he asked this, this great question. It's a question that is just really tremendous. He says, yet who knows whether you've come to the kingdom for such time as this? In other words, he says, how do you know you're not the one? We don't, any of us know. I mentioned this as we closed last week, and we'll talk a little bit more about it here in a few weeks when we talk about the providence of God. We look at our lives and we see things and we we say that really had to be the providence of god and more than likely it is but to definitively say that's the providence of god we can't really say that because we don't have god whispering in our ear and saying this is when i was with you this is when i took you this is this is how this worked out for you this is why it worked out this way it's not to say that we're doubting the providence of God. More than likely, like I say, it is. But if you think about the times in which things worked out that are told in the Bible, think about uh, Philemon and, and the, the message there that perhaps the word is used. Here it is, says, how do you know? It's still to say it's the providence of God. And like I say, I can look back in my life and I can tell you that from this point back, I can tell you certain things that happened in my life. And so this is how they were. In my opinion, that's the problem of God. In my opinion, in my belief. And I'm thankful for the way they worked out. I'm thankful. You know, I didn't like, especially some of the struggles at times. I didn't like some of those struggles. But I'm thankful that they worked out the way they did. And God's hand I believe was truly there, and I'm thankful for that. But we still ultimately have to say, I believe, and not I know. And there's the difference. And so when Mordecai tells her, he basically says, how do you know whether this is your time or not? This is your, uh, what, what would be said today is, this is your destiny. This is what you were supposed to be here for. God puts you here at this point in time for this particular purpose. And that's that's the 
the card, if you will, that Mordecai is playing to get Esther to do what uh, he wants done, and that is go in and talk to the king and get this changed with regards to the annihilation <clears throat> of the Jews. Then we pick up verse 15 where we were supposed to pick up. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So in other words, she says, okay, just, just fast with me. You ever gone on a fast? Maybe a self-imposed fast? Sometimes you do have doctors fast. You know, you, you maybe have surgery and uh, you, you fast or you, especially some surgeries, you basically you fast after the surgery till things get to working and then you, of course, start eating. But uh, fasts aren't fun, you know, and a fast for me is missing a snack, right? <laughs> That's a fast. But uh, she's wanting to fast three days. Now, in the old law, the Day of Atonement was the only feast that had a fast attached to it. And there were no other times in the Old Testament that a fast was required by God. Now, there are some that have added it through the years, and there are, there are times. Uh, does the Bible condemn fasting? No. Does the Bible say we must fast in the New Testament? The answer is no. It it says you can do it. Remember, it talks about in what is it, First Corinthians seven, that husbands and wives could could separate for a time to give themselves to fasting and prayer, but then it says they must come together again. And so, fasting is looked at from the standpoint of the Bible, really, New Testament. If you want to do it, that's fine. If you want to do it for diet reasons, for medical reasons, if you want to do it just for fun. That's not fun to me, but if you want, that's fine. It, do you have to do it? No. no. So it's not something we require, uh, you know, every January 18th. We're going to fast. Now, like I say, I know in college, <laughs> one day we fasted. We, we actually did without lunch. The food service at the time at Fried Hardman said we will give the amount of money that is, you know, we would – expend on that day or that meal for food and we will give it to the school and the school was going to give it to i think poland at the time there was some crisis going on in poland at the time and so to be honest that was not a sacrifice miss a meal there yeah we'll be glad to <laughs> but uh, you know you could fast for various reasons and her fast though is to give maybe time for prayer time for consideration Time for thought, because she says, you, you do this, you fast with me, you, you, you spend some time with me and, and thinking about what's going on. But then she goes on to say, she says, but I'll go to the king. And her attitude is, okay, if, if he kills me, he kills me. If I perish, I perish. And so Mordecai, it says, went his way, did according to all that Esther commanded him, and, and we have kind of the, the end of that little story. We move on in chapter 5. But anything anybody want to say? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sound familiar? <laughs> You're right. You're right. Yeah. 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 Anything else? All true. All good. Well, let's move on. Uh, there's a lot of things we could say, uh, a lot of lessons learned. I kind of want to think about that. I want you to 
think about in many ways, Esther changes a little bit here, in my opinion. And, and, and you know, this is truly just my opinion. Esther has seemed to be passive to this point in time. Now she seems to become a little bit more assertive, a little bit more aggressive in what she does. And, and like I say, there's a lot of lessons to learn from Esther, self-discipline, uh, planning, self-assertiveness, self-sacrifice. Uh, we'll, we'll look at some, some great lessons here in chapter 5. But let's look at now. It happened on the third day. The fast was over. The fast for Esther was over. But it happened on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes. Just in the fifth and sixth chapters, we're kind of just going to, it's a story, okay? There's not a lot of principles. There's some things we'll, we'll make mention of, but we'll help you along. This was a sign of royalty. Her royal robes stood in the inner court of the king's palace across from the king's house while the king sat on his royal throne in the royal house. This is, and he's facing the entrance of the house. This is where he's sitting, where he does his business, where he does his king business. And so she, she sees him there. So it was that when he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she sat, found favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther went near and touched the top of the scepter. Now remember, this was an act that we found out in, in chapter 4. This was an act that if the king did, he's accepting her. She comes, and, and it doesn't seem as if, at least from the text the way it reads, that she says anything. She just comes within eyesight of him. She knows where he's going to be. She comes within eyesight of him. He's pleased to see her. And we kind of got... Um, you know, what was it, last week Last week we, we got an idea that she hadn't seen him for about a month, remember? And so he sees her. It's kind of interesting. He has a harem. He probably has a large harem, but he, he recognizes her. He sees who she is. She finds pleasure. And so he extends this scepter in order to say, come on in, welcome. And so Esther went near. She touched the top of, her sep of the scepter. And the king said to her, what do you wish? Queen Esther, if you read some some of the commentaries, this and some of the folks that, that know um, the language a little bit better, they say the question is not so much what do you wish, but what's the matter? What's the matter? So when he asked her, what's the matter, Queen Esther, he, had, he then goes on to say, what is your request? It should be given to you up to half the kingdom. Realize something. Now, some have suggested, some of the, like I say, some, if you read some of the more technical books, some of them suggest that this benevolence, if you will, of giving her up to half of the kingdom, what do you want? I'll give you up to half the kingdom was sort of a, a, a stretch, a euphemistic way of saying, what do you want? What can I do for you? How can I help you? Not so much that literally he would have given her up to half the kingdom. And so thus it was a generous reply. You know, what do you want? You know, I'll give you anything you want up to a point. But it's also, if you think about it, the question also is a realization, I think, on his part, that there is something the matter. There is something wrong. There is a reason for you being here. What can I do to help you? And so Esther answered, if it pleases the king, let the king and Haman come today to the banquet that I have prepared for him. Now, here's where... If you know a little bit of Hebrew, you know, of course, Greek in the New Testament, you know a little bit of Hebrew in the Old Testament. It's interesting because look at the, the last hymn. She invites two people, right? Let the king and let Haman come to the banquet. But notice what she says. 
Come to the banquet that I have prepared for him. The him is not plural. The him is singular. In many ways, she tips her hand, but not completely, because they don't know what's going on. It's just a. It, you might say, well, it's there's really something to it. Well, let's don't make too big. Let's don't make a. You know, you've heard the old expression, don't make a mountain out of a molehill. Let's don't make a mountain out of a molehill. But yet at the same time too, it's kind of interesting that she uses the singular here, but she also uses the word prepared. Well, that 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 makes sense. You're going if you're going to have a banquet. If you're going to have a feast. If you're going to have a party, if you will. You're you're gonna you're, you're going to to prepare it. Maybe she is trying to disarm the king. Maybe she's trying to disarm Haman. Who knows? But she, it, while it seems strange that she just doesn't go in and say, hey, Ahasuerus, here's what I want. I want Haman to be put to death because he is threatening to extinguish my people. And so I want him put to death. She doesn't say that. She says, let's have a party. That is, for a lot of folks, that's a strange way of going about things. And so, like I say, maybe she's trying to disarm the, the, the king, or maybe she's trying to disarm Haman, or, or maybe it, it's just a part of her well-devised plan. And this seems to be a well-devised plan that as we go through uh, this fifth chapter and as we get into the sixth chapter, one of the things that... I see, maybe you don't, but I see is that, that it's a plan that she has and it's a plan that she sticks to. So it's it's kind of interesting. Anything anybody like to say? Yeah. Yeah. Same thing, same exact thing, which that's why some have said it's it's an idiomatic, idiomatic expression that just, you know, I'll give you, what can I give you? Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, and that's a great point that we do need to bring out. She she is very strong uh, in the fact that she moves forward in this way. That she she goes in to she goes in to the to the king, not knowing really whether he'll welcome her or not. No. Yeah. Yeah, probably so. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good point. Good point. Anything else? The king said, verse 5, bring Haman quickly that he may do as Esther has said. So the king and Haman went to the banquet that Esther had prepared. The banquet of wine, the king said to Esther, at the banquet of wine, the king said to Esther, what is your petition? It should be granted you. What's your request? Up to half the kingdom, it should be done. So he understands she needs to ask something. So evidently she has revealed that there is something in all this. Esther answered and said, my petition and request is this. If I found favor in the sight of the king and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, then let the king and Haman come to the banquet, which I will prepare for them. And tomorrow I will do as the king has said. So she says, come back for the second banquet, second day. Like Karen said, probably was plenty of wine flowing. And so maybe she she realizes that defenses will be a little weaker tomorrow. But we also do need to to fill in that little gap by understanding that parties, if you will, feasts, banquets, 
a lot of times lasted more than one day. And so, uh, you, you know, it's, it, how drunk were they? I don't know. How drunk was she trying to get them? Don't know. But she's saying, if you'll come back, just come back tomorrow. Um, oh, what's his name? David Roper, in his commentary, says that this was simply Esther's way of drawing down the defenses. In other words, today we had a good day. We had a great party. Come back tomorrow and we'll have a bigger party. And maybe that was it. But yes, uh, all true. So come back. So Haman, <clears throat> Haman begins his plot. Haman went out that day joyful and with glad heart. Good day. Had fun. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, and that he did not stand or tremble before him, he was filled with indignation against Mordecai. So he's happy. His spirits are high. He comes again to Mordecai. And more, once again, now this is not the first time. We know that. This is just an ongoing thing. Mordecai doesn't stand up. Mordecai doesn't pour, pull out praise for Haman. Oh, you're so wonderful. Or bow down to him. He doesn't. Seemingly, he acknowledges his presence, but he doesn't acknowledge it in, in a grandiose way. He doesn't acknowledge it from a standpoint of, oh, this is, you know, you, you, you're such a tremendous leader and you're such a tremendous man. And it infuriates Hey, Why? Because probably others were doing it. Others were acknowledging it. Others were saying how great he was. And it also probably points to a narcissistic attitude that Haman had, that, you know, everybody should, should do what I say. There was a, a man that filled out a, a survey once, and he was asked why he thought that uh, he would be qualified for something. And he said, because the young think they have all the answers, and those of us that are old do. He lacked humility. He lacked understanding. Well, maybe that's what's going on a little bit here with Haman. Who knows? Haman is upset. He's filled. Notice that the words that are used, filled with indignation against Mordecai. This is not, oh, well, I'm going to dismiss him. He is irate. And so nevertheless, Haman restrained himself, went home, and he sent and called for his friends and his wife, Zeresh. So let's, let's get everybody in. Let's get friends. Let's get my wife. And Haman then told them of his great riches, the multitude of his children. And, and we do know, as we'll keep reading this, get into the ninth chapter, we'll find out that he had ten sons. So we don't know exactly how many, but he more, might have, you know, daughters and things of that nature. But he had ten sons. Everything in which the king had promoted him, how he had advanced him above the officials and servants of the king. He talked about his greatness. He gathers his folks together. He gathers his kin folks into his house that evening. And for whatever reason, he has to build up his ego. So he talks about himself and how great he is. Sounds a little bit egotistical, doesn't it? And so, verse 12, Haman, moreover Haman said, besides Queen Esther invited no one but me to come in with king to the banquet that she prepared. And tomorrow I'm again invited by her along with the king. Yet all this avails me nothing so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting in the gate, king's gate. Now, isn't it interesting that as he toots his own horn, as he proclaims his own greatness, his hang-up is with one man. Now, there are certain scholars, and I, I, I can't say this is fact or, or true or not, but there are some that say that maybe it wasn't just Mordecai that was not honoring Haman. Maybe it was the Jewish folks. Because remember we said when this first started, we said some would have said, well, you, know, you don't bow down worshiping 
or anyone other than God. And so the Jews would have felt that way. And so it seems as if, while some would say that Mordecai is being used here as sort of the the name, the central name, but all those that were of his family were doing the same thing, that could be a possibility. But don't say that that's a certainty. Let's just stick with the idea that it's just Mordecai. Because it seemed to be others. Of course, you would have had Persians through, throughout that as uh, Haman would have seen them, he would have, have truly you know, relished in as they would have talked about his greatness. But Haman gets all of his family together and he says, look how great I am. He says, I've got all these riches. I've gotten promoted by the king. I, I, I've, I've got this multitude, this huge family. God has blessed me. Everything's wonderful. And, and I'm an official. And he says, Queen Esther, when she had this banquet, man, she, she only had the king and me. She only had the two of us. And so his wife, then, Zeresh, all of his friends said to him, let a gallows be made. Now, remember, we said a gallows. We think of a hanging gallows often, or I do. Maybe you don't. I do. But the the word, the Hebrew word that's used here means to impale. And so it could have been some way to have impaled someone as opposed to a hanging gallows. It, it's, a, it's a means of execution, whatever ever exactly how it is. But... He said, they tell him, well, let's build a gallows. Notice that that they said to to him, let a gallows be made 50 cubits high. This is 75 feet high. Equate it in today's standards. We equate, I think it's 10 feet. Jim, you can help me on this. It's 10 feet to the story, isn't it? So it's seven and a half stories tall. And so... That therein lies a, a huge, why would they erect it so high? Who knows? Maybe it was so everybody could see. Maybe it was so you could see it not only just up close, but you could see it at a distance. Maybe it was due to the fact that they wanted to, to make it huge. Maybe it was to the fact, though, too, they might have been trying to say, Mordecai, this is ridiculous. But maybe it was also just to, they thought, a way to appease his ego. You know, let's make it big. Let's make it let's make it huge because that's kind of the character you are. We don't know why 75 feet, but this is what they proposed. And they said, let's make it. And in the morning, suggest to the king that Mordecai be hanged on it. Then go merrily with the king to the banquet. Oh. He has some kind of friends, doesn't he? that would give him that advice. It does remind us as well, of course, probably all of us know how this story ends. Right? We know we know that if, I, if I'm spoiling the end for you, you know, put your fingers in your ears, but, but I think we all know Haman is ultimately hung on his, on his own gallows. He's, he's if you will, he's whether it's impaled or whether he's hung, he is killed upon the gallows which he erected. But it is to say that this suggestion from his friends, albeit strong, fits him. And the idea, notice what it says, and the thing pleased him. So the gallows were made. The plan as far as Haman goes, is getting put into place. Anything anybody would like to say? There's two or three lessons I want you to think about, but is there anything anybody wants to say? That's right. That's right. That's right. And we need to we need to be sure. One of the things that this time as I'm reading this and studying this again, is to think about the advice that we get from people 
All advice that you get is not good advice. And, of course, we act upon the advice that we get. And so it is good for us to get good advice, to be around good people. And like you say, friends, sometimes the advice they give us is simply what they think we want to hear. So sometimes, you know, you, you've had people, you've seen people maybe in in power that put folks that don't necessarily agree with them in positions. And the reason is, is because they want that that contrary, that, that bit of advice that they, they want to hear that to, to know what's going on, to know what's happening. When I was in Waverly, working as the associate minister in Waverly, uh, I met regularly with the elders. And working with young people, you, you do things that, are truly biblical and truly scriptural, but you go, you know, will the church be all right with this? Will it be all right with this activity? Will it be all right with that activity? Can we do this? Can we do that? And you always want to make it uh, such that, that the elders, you know, back you. Of course, I had a, a, a great agreement, and one of the elders came up with it. One of the elders came up and he said, he said, you need to know this. He says, if a parent ever comes to you and doesn't like what you do, doesn't agree with what you do, tell them to come to the elders, and we will have your back. So I had a pretty wide door to go through. But when I would go to them and talk to them, I would say, okay, here's maybe what I want to do. And sometimes the things that I wanted to do – I, I were congregation-wide. They weren't with just the young people because I was the associate minister. I wasn't the youth minister. I was the associate minister. And I would, I'd give them and I'd say, okay, here's what I want to do. Here's this side of it and here's the other side of it. <laughs> One of the elders looked at me. And he said, why do you always do that? And I said, well, I've been thinking about this for a while. I've been thinking about the pluses and minuses, whether we should or shouldn't do it. And I said, here I am giving it to you and you've basically got five minutes to discuss it and make up your mind about it. oh okay and i try to do that with everybody and everything and here's this side but how about this side think about it and so you do that in counseling if you want to to affect people and you want to affect them in a good way okay here's this side but what about this side have you thought about because most of us really haven't thought about the other side right what have we thought about our side our side and i'll never forget one session in particular where this couple called me up they wanted they wanted a religious this is what they said they wanted a religious man to counsel them they were having trouble now what you find out through years of doing that is we want a preacher to help us because we are having trouble but we don't want to pay anybody because in talking to them, they didn't go to church anywhere. And I was just as good for them as anybody else. But anyway, it only took one session, really, because as I listened to them, here's what I said. I looked at him when she was talking and I said, do you hear what she's saying? Well, no. I said, listen. And I said, say it again. And she ran through it again. And I said, now, what did she say? And he caught on to one or two things. Not all of them, but he caught on to one or two things that she says, I've been trying to tell him this for, for the last, never how long it was. And I said, yeah, he's not listening. And then I said to him, all right, tell your side of it. This is what he wanted. All this is his side. And I looked at her and I said, did you hear that? And she said, huh? I said, tell it again. And so he told his side and, and she picked up on a couple of things. And I said, now, did you hear this, this, and this? Well, no. And I said, y'all are not listening to each other. You're getting only what you want to hear out of it. Oh. And so then we worked on how to communicate. 
That was their problem. How did you communicate? Well, so you got to be careful. And that's I, that's a good point. That's a couple of two or three points that I want to make here in this chapter. When you think about, well, what can we learn? Well, one of the things we can learn is be careful who you listen to. What are some other lessons? I think uh, in verse 1, we, we learn a great lesson, and that is really Esther had a sacrificial attitude. I'm, I'm going. I may die. Now, she had that in the fourth chapter as well. But she was ready to die. And in ready to die, in being ready to die, if you notice in the fourth verse, there's a self-control that she has. She doesn't just, as we said, she doesn't just say, hey, king, this is the way it is. This is what it is. This is what I want. Da, da. She has a plan, and she's going about that plan. And so uh, she, she truly is a lady that I don't look at her as being terrible. I look at her as being a lady that says, this is the end I want. I know how I'm going to get there. And I'm going to take the, the long route. I'm not going to take the short route. I'm going to take the plan route. I'm going to take getting it finished to the best way I know how. Another lesson that we might learn is to count your blessings. Talk about uh, Haman all you want to in verses 10 and 11. Talk about how terrible he is. But one of the things in many ways that he's doing is he's counting his blessings. He's counting this is the good that's going on. This is the good that's in my life. So learn learn to count your blessings. But then another lesson that we learn is the terrible, if you will, the terribleness of pride and how pride can destroy. And pride ultimately destroys Haman. And we need to be careful. Pride... Of course, leads, Proverbs talks about pride leads to destruction and ultimately leads to a fall. Of course, uh, the pride of, of Herod in the New Testament is a great example in, in Acts chapter 12, who ultimately died and was eaten with worms. And, and so we've got to remember that story as well as, as being a great teacher of be humble, be humble. Anything else? All right, we've got two, three minutes. Let's mosey on into the sixth chapter. We'll kind of get it started. Once again, this is just, we'll sort of just reveal the story, but it's the story. The night, that night, the king could not sleep. So one was commanded to bring the books of the records of the Chronicles, and they read before the king. You couldn't go in, turn on the light, right? Didn't go to the refrigerator. <laughs> Couldn't sleep. So what does he do? Well, he gets somebody to bring in the book of the Chronicles. What are the book of the books of the Chronicles? Well, is it is it uh, the Chronicles with regards to you know first second Chronicles? Well, it, it seems as if more it's the Chronicles of his doings because as you go on and read in verse two, it says it was found written that Mordecai had told of Big Thana and uh, Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, doorkeepers, who sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. So he can't sleep. So he calls for certain ones to bring in, bring in books. Come on, bring in books. Bring in the Chronicles of the Kings. And let's go over and let's rehash what's happened during my reign. King sounds like he has an ego problem as well, doesn't it? Let's hear, let's hear about, but look at it differently. Look at it another way. And, and maybe what we just said is true, but maybe, maybe he wanted to hear because he wanted to be reminded of the things in the past that he was afraid he'd forgotten. You can look at him as a bad guy, but you can also look at him as a, as a guy that has some wisdom about him. Either way. When they come in, they, they tell him, remember the plot that was told earlier in the book of Esther, the plot to, to kill the king, and this is one of the ways that, that Esther, if you will, found favor with the king. And so he is reminded now of the instance that maybe he had forgotten. And the king says in verse 3, 
What honor or dignity has been bestowed upon Mordecai for this? And the king's servant who attended him said, nothing has been done for him. Uh, That's a great place for us to stop. But basically he says, okay, what honor did we give him? Well, sometimes, sometimes you forget to give honor to people. Sometimes life moves on. Life moves fast and it moves on and we forget uh, we, we intended on doing something for them, but we forgot. And so consequently, nothing is ever done. And sometimes, you know, one thing leads to the other. Think about the news. Something's always in the news, right? Until something else happens. And then that something else. The news a few weeks ago was all about the Ukraine. Justifiably so. Now very little news time is dedicated to the Ukraine. What's now? Well, the Supreme Court's overturning Roe versus Wade. How long is that going to be on the front burner? Now, it will always be there, but how long will it be on the front burner? Till something major happens that the news cycle folks deem worthy, and then that's all we'll hear about. And that's a whole, I realize that gets us into a whole different issue. <laughs> Anything else? Just another example of God's providence. With regards to what? Him being reminded? Yeah. If if it's not, the coincidence of that is so, the possibility is so remote that you have to think it's part of the providence of God. I do. No, it affects everybody. Go through it. And of course, you're a great Bible study, a student. Uh, the, the times, especially in the Kings and the Chronicles, where God used evil nations to correct what was going on. So no, and, and God uses others that are not Christians to, to affect us, to affect the, the child of God. And so, yeah, good point. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Perhaps. Perhaps. And uh, for me, the question that comes to me and smacks me kind of in the face is right here in Esther. In what we just read in the fourth chapter, maybe it's you. Maybe it's you. So so then it to me it comes to this answer. Do what you can with all you have, knowing what's there, and and try to be that conduit for good. And then let, if you will, kind of let this expression come, let the chips fall where they may. But great point. Great question. Great point. Anything else? All right. Well, they're here. So um, let's have a short prayer, though. We need prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for this day, thankful that you love us and watch over us, thankful for this great book of Esther, for what it teaches us and what we need to be mindful of. We ask that you watch over us, that you bless us and keep us. Forgive us of our sins for the supper in Christ's name. Amen. Y'all have a great week. See ya.